Okay, um, can you hear me? Thank you. Um, I'm Wen Ying Shou from UCL. I have given five minutes of my time to uh, Alex so that he has more time to talk about his work. So I want to first give an overview of some of the lab interests with the under theme of why might math be useful in biology. And then we'll discuss evolution in a synthetic microbial community. We are interested in evolution of cooperation, the act of paying a cost to help others. So for example, the first species cannot make, uh, cannot make A, but pays a cost to overproduce B, and the second species cannot make B, but overproduces A. And the overproduced compounds are released into the environment, allowing the two um, strains to cooperate. And of course, we can have cheaters that take, but do not reciprocate. And because they do not pay the cost of reciprocation, those cheaters would grow faster than the cooperators. So then you would predict cheaters would take over the community. But we can mix the three types of cells at one to one to one in a spatially structured environment that is to place them on top of our growth pad, and then we'll just wait for them to grow. And what we see in both simulations and experiments, the top view is that the, cooperating, the two cooperating strains are mixed and the blue cheaters are spatially isolated. So spatial self-organization allows cooperators to exclude cheaters. So here, even though the simulations and experiments differ um, slightly in details, but the major patterns are captured. So that gives us, um, that reassures us that just the metabolic interactions alone is sufficient to explain this difference, uh, this, this pattern. And so math gives you confidence. We are also very interested in quantitatively understanding uh, community behavior. So again, going back to the cooperative community, it turns out that because of this um, interactions, the strain ratio always reaches a fixed value. And that means the two strains must grow at the same rate. Otherwise, the ratio can never be fixed. And so we call this community growth rate. So we can measure the release consumption phenotypes in monocultures like what Caroline did, and then we try to um, predict how fast the community would grow. So the original model gives you, you know, this prediction. And then when we do experiments, they're different. And even though the difference might seem small, but remember growth is exponential. So even small difference in the predicted versus real um, growth rate would lead to exponential divergence between observed and predicted dynamics. So that got us thinking, what are we missing? So when we find out what's missing, incorporating these findings, now we have quantitative agreement between experiments and modeling. So math motivates biological discoveries. The third direction is artificial selection of microbial communities. So imagine you have a community of two different species. The first one would convert the substrates to intermediate, and the second one would convert intermediate to, um, to a product. So then the two together, but not any single species alone, are able to convert from substrates to product. So how might we improve this community function, which relies on both, uh, both strains? So we can start with a population of communities and then allow them to grow, during which cells would grow, they will mutate and they will interact. And at the end of the cycle, we will test the product accumulation in different adult communities. And we pick the one with the highest product, right, the drug production, and split and reproduce that by splitting each into multiple offspring communities. So that gets into a bit the theme of community now <laughs> is a unit of selection, but artificially. So this seems simple, right? You get what you select for. But in reality, if you look at previous experimental efforts, they are um, at best moderately uh, successful because there are many experimental variables you can change. So it's not clear how, what is the best way of carrying out such experiment. So we performed the simulations, uh, experimental, uh, simulated experimental protocols for method one and method two. You can see that the efficacy uh, are drastically different. And because, because of simula in simulations, you can save all the intermediate steps. You can do troubleshooting far more effectively than doing experiments. So that actually taught us how to do experiments. So math helps experimental design. And so with that, I want to get into the main topic, evolution in a synthetic yeast cooperative community. Now just to replace A and B with two metabolites, right? So lysine, so L minus A plus cannot make lysine, but pay a cost to overproduce adenine. And A minus L plus cannot make adenine and overproduce lysine. 
and actually is adenine is adenine precursor, but for simplicity, I would just call it adenine. So these overproduced metabolites are released into medium, allowing the two um, to cooperate. And we call this cooperation that is synthetic and mutually obligatory or cosmo. So now let's consider, take a step back to consider if fitness effects of a mutation. And it, let's consider the simplest scenario in a well-mixed environment, which always favors the fastest growers. So now for individual, the fitness effect on self can be zero, minus or plus, right? Neutral, deleterious, or beneficial. But, if you, but in reality, it's more complex, right? Because pleiotropy can occur. So for example, if you have a mutation that increases your rate, it could um, reduce the yield so that if the cells are in an environment that favors high yield, this mutation will now become deleterious. So it's very environment dependent and because of pleiotropy. But in a community, this is even more complex, right? Because you can consider fitness effects not only on self, but also on partner. And on self, it can be zero minus plus. On partner, it can be zero minus plus. So three by three, there will be nine types of interactions, right? So I list them all here. And let's consider again the, the cooperative community. And so in this case, we're not interested in any interactions that are purely zero or minus, because that can never be selected for in a well-mixed environment. So we're left with five types of interactions. Of, sorry, five types of fitness effects. Um, so, um, but in a well-mixed environment, the, um, this self-benefiting aspects are always favored because well-mixed environment favors fastest growers. And so these other two types could be favored in a spatially structured environment, but I will not discuss them, just the three types. So the first type is self, strictly self-serving. The second one is cheating, right? It, gaining a best uh, a benefit by, by uh, compromising partner's fitness. And third one is win-win. Uh, so we just want to see whether win-win mutations could occur. The answer is yes, and I will show you evidence. So we evolved the Cosmo in a well-mixed environment, starting with low densities in replicates. So we let them grow to high density, and then we dilute and repeat the cycle. And, uh, and then we only focus on one population, L minus A plus, and we will isolate clones from that, and we do whole genome sequencing. And then we ask, do we see recurring mutations? Because if a mutation repeatedly occurs, then it's likely to be adaptive. And then we measure phenotypes, right? So we ask whether it's self-serving and or partner-serving. So let's look at the mutations. So at early stage, so we see recurrent genetic changes in one of the three, right? So it's chromosome 14 duplication, ECM21, RSP5. And because yeast is such a well-studied organisms, organism, so we can quickly figure out what's going on. So it turns out chromosome 14 harbors LIP1 gene, which encodes the high affinity lysine permease. So the duplication means doubling of LIP1 protein. And then ECM21 RSP5 mutation um, would stabilize the LIP1 protein. So this all makes sense, right? All these mutations serve to increase the uh, high affinity lysine permease abundance in the cell. So that would presumably help cells to um, help cells to um, to um, to compete against the ancestor. That is, the mutants should grow faster than the ancestor in limiting lysine, and that's self-serving because you're helping yourself to outcompete your um, your ancestor. So we measured that. So we look at growth rate against at different concentrations of lysine. You are using a fluorescence a microscopy assay. And so here is the ancestor. And all the other curves uh, uh, evolved, uh, evolved clones. And the important thing is that the community environment is under low lysine concentrations around one micromolar. And in this range, every single evolved clone grows faster than the ancestor, as expected, because it, they, they are isolated from a well-mixed environment and favoring fast growth. So now we know that every single um, recurrent mutation seems to be self-serving, but what about partner-serving? But then I might ask, what is partner-serving? Does that mean it's increased adenine release because the partner needs adenine? So it's an increased adenine release rate, right? So in terms of adenine release per cell per hour, that makes sense. Right, because if you want to be more partner serving, you will release more. But turns out this thought is incorrect. Um, it took us an article to realize that. And then, um, but actually the real way is to normalize. You normalize the adenine release rate 
by lysine consumption, and which makes sense, right? Because this, all these cells will need the lysine to produce adenine. So this is the, um, and to put it in a more quantitative perspective, so it turns out that self-growth rate equals partner growth rate equals community growth rate equals square root of this number, which um, if you compare is identical to this, and then multiply that for the partner. And if you cancel out all the units, it's correct, right? It's a square root of per hour, per hour, so it's per hour. So the unit is also correct. So this directly says, right, if your partner serving, you're not only increasing your partner's growth rate, but entire community, including yourself's growth rate. And note the affinity for lysine, right? It doesn't show up in this because it doesn't really matter, right? If you, your rate limiting step is how fast the partner is, serve, is giving you metabolites, how high affinity for you have for that metabolite actually does not matter for how fast the entire community would grow. So we will measure that, right? measure this release rate normalized by consumption. So as Caroline kind of alluded to, that this kind of phenotypes, right, if you want to really understand it, you have to measure a community in a community-like environment. So we did this in a chemostats, which can mimic uh, the lysine-limited environment of the community. So how it works is as following, right? So your fresh minimal medium, and uh, it's dripped in, it's constant rate. And the stir bar makes sure that it's well mixed. And then the overflow um, gets out. So you have fixed cultural volume. And the dilution rate is simply flow rate, like in the sense of milliliter per hour divided by this volume, divided by milliliters, so you have a unit of per hour. And then let's look at some equations, right? So the live cell density increases because of birth. Right, how many cells there are to give birth and the birth rate, and it's decreased due to death and dilution. And the lysine concentration in the chemostat uh, culture is increased due to the influx, right, the L-in, but it's uh, reduced by consumption because of birth of cells, and it's reduced by the dilution out. And generally, this, this concentration is low, so this can be uh, approximated as zero. Now, the adenine concentration in the supernatant is increased because of release by those cells. So release rate times live cell density. And it's decreased because of the dilution. So at a steady state, we can set all these equations to zero, right? So, um, so for the first one, birth rate equals death rate plus dilution rate. And because, uh, uh, because death rate is small, so basically we have this. So you can control the birth rate by controlling the dilution rate. And then the second one, we just set the equal right to this. So we get this. And because, because birth rate equals dilution rate, we can cancel these out. And then we have um, the consumption equals L in, how much the concentration of the uh, uh, lysine in the fresh medium divided by cell density. And the release rate, third one, we just put this equal sign there. And then we just get this. So if we put this release rate normalized by consumption, we can cancel out and we just get this one. And it's really interesting, right? So because the dilution rate, you know, because you set the pump, the L in, you know, because you make the medium. So the only thing you need to measure is the adenine concentration in the supernatant. So that, is, that goes back to um, how math can help experimental design. It tells you what parameters you need to measure. So how do we, uh, so this uh, adenine concentration can simply be measured by uh, chemically through HPLC or biologically by looking at how much cells it can, um, by measuring like the, the cell growth in this, uh, in this supernatant. And the two measurements, two ways of, uh, two assays uh, give similar results. So now we can look at, right? So we look at the diazomy 14. And it, so we look at the release rate normalized by consumption. There's no difference. So it's not partner serving. But ECM21 is, right? Because the, the release over consumption is 1.6 fold. And the recall of this, so this 1.6 fold increase would lead to increase in community growth rate. And indeed, we see the increased growth rate equals square root of this, it's about 1.3 fold. So it's, the entire system is self-consistent. So it is, it's self-serving, it's partner serving, so it is win-win. So summary one, cooperation can be promoted if self-serving and partner serving traits are coupled. And we can look back at the in natural systems in dixysteum, uh, in dixysteum, when cells are starved, they would aggregate and form a fruiting body. A fraction of the cells will become stock and its evolutionary dead end, and the fraction will become spores, which can reproduce. So Kevin Foster showed that DMA mutant that attempts to avoid stock fate, right? So they refuse to serve partner. 
they also cannot serve self in the sense that they cannot differentiate into spores. So we showed that win-win mutations can readily arise to promote cooperation, even in an engineered community, which does not have any um, history of cooperation. So now let's look at the later stage of this uh, evolution. And very surprisingly, we see the emergence of this um, of, of oxytrophic mutations. So what do these what do these do? Right. So as Sono discussed yesterday, so yeast can uh, reduce the sulfate and conjugate the reduced sul uh, sulfide onto organic carbon backbone to organosulfurs. So these mutations block the synthesis of homocysteine. And then these different organosulfurs are interconvertible, right? So basically these cells will not be able to grow because they cannot make their own organosulfurs. And so we call this uh, org S minus mutants. So this is very surprising, right? Because we have ancestral cells that can make, uh, make organosulfurs. And fine, mutation can occur. They always just occur by random chance. But the, the, the probability, right? I mean, the, the, the fraction would be less than one in 10 to the eighth. But experimentally, we observe them to rise to 10%. So how can this rise in this, given that they cannot make organosulfurs and that organosulfurs are not even supplied in the medium? So then, of course, the obvious candidate is that those org S plus cells are somehow releasing org S to org S is support these uh, oxytrophic mutants. So we looked at, we looked at this lysine limited chemostat, take the supernatant. We ask, can it support the MET minus growth? The answer is yes. And we did LCMS. We find that actually glutathione is released. And so glutathione is organosulfur. We also found um, glutathione conjugates, GSX. So, um, so that is, uh, so glutathione and conjugates are released during uh, lysine uh, limitation. And so GSH is redox buffer. It's involved in cellular response to oxidative stresses and detoxif detoxification of metals and xenobiotics and the synthesis of iron sulfur clusters in mitochondria. So why uh, are these released? We do not know, we can only speculate. The export of GSH might facilitate reductive reactions uh, re uh, to you know, protect the cell membrane. So the cell membrane is in a reducing environment. And the GSX is exported probably because cells want to detoxify, but we do not actually know the answer. But anyway, so now we know that these org S plus cells under lysine limitation will release organosulfurs, but still does not address how could these cells have such a fitness advantage such that it will rise to 10%. So, so there is one hypothesis called energy saving hypothesis and Galen de Souza in the audience also worked on that. So the, it, postured, uh, it, it posits that because the oxytrophs have advantage because they save the energy of making the compound they're oxytrophic for. So we tested this, right? So we, we compared like lice minus um, and the lice minus or S minus in, in excess lysine in the GSH. It turns out the mutant actually grow slower, not faster than ancestor. So this hypothesis does not apply to our situation. So then we look at about the uh, lysine limitation or zero lysine, right? So we see this lysine minus cells just die. They don't have lysine, they die. And so for these, uh, for those mutants, if you have zero lysine and zero organosulfurs, they actually uh, survive. And strikingly, if you actually give them a lot of um, organosulfurs, they actually start dying, right? So what? how would we explain this phenomenon? So it turns out that David Botzing lab has found this phenomenon. So for wild type cells, they check, do I have, um, do I have this resources, right? Sulfur, glucose, and phosphate, and so on and so forth. If everything's ready, grow. And uh, if they missing one essential metabolite, then what they will do, they will growth arrest and do stress response so they can survive. So this is a proper nutrient growth regulation. Growth is tuned to the availability of the nutrient. But let's add a look at what happens to the lysine minus at the lower lysine. So we'll check around. Yeah, it has everything, sulfur, glucose, uh, everything, right? It does not know that it ca cannot make lysine. So attempt to grow, and this attempted growth leads to death. And so this is a nutrient growth dysregulation. And then now let's look at the org S mutant at the low lysine and high GSH. So it looks around, of course it has sulfur because GSH is sulfur and glucose. So cells will again attempt to grow not knowing that they cannot make lysine in the, the environment does not provide enough lysine. So this attempted growth again leads to death. 
Right? So these two curves are these two curves. So now, um, now if JSH is low, so what happens is that it looks around, it says, well, sulfur is actually low because JSH is low. So we'll now proceed to growth arrest and stress response. So this is restoring the nutrient growth regulation. And this gives rise to this curve. So sulfur's limitation helps orgas minus mutant to survive by turning on stress response pathway. And so, but this is a lysine uh, absence, right? What about lysine limitation? We can do competition experiments of orgas minus to orgas plus. Right? So at, if it's a high, start at a high ratio, then there's not enough orgas to support these growth. So the growth rate is slow, so then the, the um, abundance drops, the relative abundance drops. And then if it starts at the low, it indeed rises in frequency, suggesting fitness advantage. And of course, if we start at steady state, it would remain at the steady state. So now, summary of the second story. So how it happens is the following, right? So the lysine limitation, those cells actually suffer nutrient growth dysregulation. And as a result, they will release compounds such as glutathione, and glutathione conjugates. And then the mutation, OGS minus mutation occurs just by chance. Right, but now these mutants are supported by this release of organosulfurs. And then it rises in frequency because they have restored, right? So it's a organosulfur limitation now restores this proper growth regulation. And then it reaches it will increase in frequency until they reach the steady state frequency. So, um, so I want to finish the talk by doing some reflections, right? So I feel like the, 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 um, the bigger picture is that I think we need to broaden the thinking of mutation pleiotropy in community. So I mean, mutation itself, of course, can affect multiple phenotypes of self, but it can also affect the, uh, the, the phenotypes of partners. And ECM21 is example. And the second, we need to be mindful about unintended effects of engineering strengths. So for example, oxytrophic yeast mutants suffer nutrient growth dysregulation. That's not what we wanted to, um, to have in our model. But still, I argue that we, ha you know, we have learned a lot from Cosmo. For example, how to define partner serving and how to properly quantify monoculture phenotypes so that we can understand the community behavior and also how might cooperation evolve to fend off cheaters. But I would argue that even problematic strains like this yeast octopic mutants can be interesting depending on your perspective. So for, a, you know, so for a while, we were really worried that we spent years studying the artifact of nutrient growth dysregulation. But upon, we, upon looking into literature, it turns out that, it, that the phenomenon is conserved throughout all eukaryotes and that cancer cells also suffer this nutrient growth dysregulation. So we just spin the story around it in a different way and to say, well, how might growth uh, nutrient growth dysregulated cells evolve, right? So, um, but importantly, these kind of phenomenon uh, raises new questions, right? For example, uh, so this, I just talked about that. So like what, what metabolites could be released cells if they encounter evolution and novel stress, right? So the inability to make lysine is evolution and novel stress, but there could be other evolution and novel stresses and then what metabolites could be released by cells. And then as a consequence of that, what new metabolic interactions could arise? So with that, I want to thank um, the people who did the work. So Sam Hart is a major driver for the win-win mutations with the help of Jose and Chi Chen. And uh, uh, Robin and Sono um, are the, the, the equal contribution first authors for the, um, for the second part of the talk um, with, in collaboration with uh, Josh Rivenowitz, who did the, the lab, who did the, the uh, mass spec. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Wenying. Um, yeah, we've definitely got time for a few questions. Welcome. Oh, yes. So Orkin was asking about the other partner, A minus L plus. Yes, we also see recurring mutations, but we have not followed these through because L minus A plus has kept us really busy. Yeah, but you know, it's a good question, like how common, like another direction would be see how common it is to have side effects. So these pleiotropic effects on the partner. When you, you, know, you increase your self-fitness and then what happens? And then the other direction is to look at how spatially structured environment might affect evolutionary outcomes where the other type two types might, right? Other mutations that 
um, at harm of self to help partner could rise in frequency because the partner helps you back. Right, so okay, yes. Yes. Um, depending on who you are, right? So if you're a wild type, if your product, if you can make your own organo sulfurs, it's no, no sulfur limitation because you can make your own. But for those org S minus mutants, they cannot make their own organic, uh, organo sulfurs. So then they are completely relying on partner supply and that can be limiting. So then that's why they suffer sulfur limitation. Yes. Um, I, I had another sort of philosophical question, which might be a bit na naive. So when I was an undergraduate, it was a big debate about whether group selection really exists. Now, um, so the win-win selection that you've observed, that's not necessarily community selection, is it? Because it still favors the individual music. Absolutely right. So community, it's not community selection because community is not a unit of reproduction. Here, we just propagate, just have subsample the community and grow it, right? But if you want to do community level selection, you would have to allow the community itself to reproduce. Right, into multiple communities so that different, you know, different you know, adult communities have different reproductive fitness, which is not the case. Your point is well taken. And yes. But do you think that situation ever happens in the real world? That was one of the concepts <laughs> we're talking about. Yes. I do not know. So I want to ask the audience this question, right? So suppose we, that, you know, like human gut and cow guts evolved to be, of course, very differently. We have different environments. And because of this, you reproducibly recruit a set of microbes. Do you call that co-evolution? I mean, I'm just asking, right? Do you call that co-evolution or not? Or does it have to be vertically transmitted? Right? Some in, in those imbalance are vertically transmitted, right? Because it transmitted through the, from the mother to, to offspring. So that's definitely selection at the community level because of that uh, vertical selection. But if you have environments that evolve to be different and you always recruit a reproducible set, do you call that co-evolution? Yes, no. <laughs> You would call what? Yes, as long as it, so you can, sorry. So I think, I haven't thought about it too much, but you can think of it as a quantitative base. So if like more than 50% of the time you end up having them be in the same situation in the next generation, then I would say yes. Yes, I, I'm not formulating my own thoughts yet on this question. <laughs> well, it's definitely an interesting thing to think about. So let's thank Wen Ying again. Thank you. And I, I think our next speaker is one of Wen Ying's collaborators, that's Alex, um, from Fred Hutchinson. Um.